Okay, so this is week 7, lecture 2. So recall that last time what we did was we looked at the subsystem, the hardware subsystem. So what I'm going to do today is actually go through the software, but then let's wrap up the hardware subsystem first. So we'll start the SD card next lecture. Now what I've done is I've actually, the Eclipse path names never work out. So I just create a new workspace and I create a new project from scratch, the software project that is, with the understanding that uh, these are my source code, the .c and the .h file. So I put them in a different directory. So I put them in a different directory and then create like a new software project and put, paste them back in. That's what I do. So anyway, here is all, here are all the different designs we're talking about. Oh, sorry, different modules. So let me minimize this. So there's DRAM controller, standard society, timer, JTAG, UART, hex out, key in. So we were discussing the character buffer. So the character buffer is connected to the alpha blender. And then we also discussed the pixel buffer. Yes. So notice that uh, and where we stopped was we basically justified why need why we need 320 by 240 because of the lack of memory right external memory sram now something important since i'm using sram okay to store my pixel buffer i need two things number one i need this sram controller and you can actually get this from the university program so we go under university program memory there is the sram controller okay so i put that in here and the configuration of this is very easy just pick the board we want and use as use this as a pixel buffer but then the thing is when you assign the base address of this memory you have to add this to your pixel buffer okay because that's the buffer start address so if you forget that the you just won't display anything right because it won't read right by default this is zero zero right you'll probably overwrite your code so again there is no like debugger here there is like the GDB, but you don't have any like operating system to protect you. So you really have to, your code, you really have to know what you're doing. Right. But then you, if you don't, you will get designs that will synthesize, but they just won't work. So anyway, so once we configure the pixel buffer, notice how it's, notice the configuration. In the sense, if I go into the NIOS 2, okay. So the data master, oh, where's my SRAM? Okay, so the data master goes into SRAM from the NIOS, okay? What the important thing to notice is that the pixel bar and the data master also goes to the uh, control sleeve, okay? Let's see, let's go to the university program clocks, clocks. The important thing to notice is that the pixel buffer writes to the SRAM slave. You see that? Okay. So the NIOS data master goes to both of these, but then you need to you need to store your pixels, right? So that's why this connection is there. Can you see that? Number one. Number two, to access data from the SRAM, okay, you use the pixel buffer. That's the second point. So all you do using these SRAM is you write to it from the pixel buffer. And then you read the pixels back from the buffer. Okay. This actually also has a DMA controller in there. So it's pretty fast. So the SRAM is standard besides that. In the sense there's the clock, there's the reset. The external interface is our conduit. So this is how if you go into HDL, you connect, oops, that says DRAM. You connect to your SRAM on chip, right? There's nothing, uh, you don't have to use a bus here. There's nothing like extraneous to do like the SDRAM. It's very simple, right? So the pixel buffer, as you can see, is not visible at the component level, okay? So are these connections clear? There is pixel buffer, uh, oops, writes to SRAM, and then you read from the pixel buffer. Now, so is this clear, the SRAM and the pixel buffer? 
So now what we got to do is we have a 322, 40, 16 bit. We have to convert that to 30 bit, 640 by 480. So I use an RGB resampler core, 16 to 30 bits. <coughs> and then I use a pixel scaler. <coughs> Excuse me. So incoming is 32240, factor of two, pixel format, which I'm coming in is 30 bits, okay? And the output of the pixel scaler goes into the background of my alpha blender, right? The clock for my alpha, alpha blender is basically the sys clock from the university program, so is the reset. The only place where you use a 25 megahertz clock is on the output clock, of the pick uh, the FIFO, right? Of course, for the VGA controller as well. Okay, oops, that's the sync. Oh, okay, wait, wait, I screwed that up. So the clock, no, no, I didn't screw it up. Sorry. So the clock for the VGA controller is the VGA clock. So is the output clock for the pixel buffer. Okay, right there, and right there. Everything else is obviously sys clock. Okay, for example, here. Yeah. There's a way to highlight this in blue. I just can't seem to get it. But that's how you write both characters and pixels. Okay. So the, again, the main idea is you have a character buffer which you go into the foreground sync of the Alpha Blender, but for the pixel buffer. Since you don't have external memory, right? You need to use SRAM. We are planning. We are using SRAM, and since we don't have enough SRAM, we have to configure the pixel buffer as 320 by 240 by 16 pixels. I mean, 16 bits per pixel, or 16 bit RGB. Then we convert it into 640 by 480 30 bit RGB by using the RGB resampler first to convert 16 bit to 30 bit. Then the pixel scaler to convert. Uh, from 32240 to 64480 and the reason why we need to do that is because the VGA controller and consequently the alpha blender that's the resolution they expect 640 by 480 by 30 bit yeah. so any questions on the hardware and like we discussed last lecture i'm using two cores right one for the keyboard one for the mouse the mouse is via gpio and you can see in the external conduit uh, i've connected it to gpio So here is external conduit for the mouse. And there's the GPIO connection. I've also enabled, if you go under pin planner, I've enabled the weak pull up. But the thing you got to be careful of is. This is 3.3 volts, okay? Ideally, it needs to be 5 volts. That would potentially be an issue, okay? So, again, any questions on the hardware? All right, so let's just look at the software. So, for the software, again, I have basically recreated the project and added my two files in. So, in general, in your software, there is initialization routines. Uh, there are interrupt enable routines. And you have to write the ISR. Those are the three main things. And you pretty much, again, just like hardware, have to take care of everything. Right? Because there is no operating system to help you out. You can put an operating system on the D1 NIOS if you have a memory management unit. But we're not going to do that. Okay. So, so there's a question asked about the ELF file. So here's the ELF file. right? So we don't have any errors. You should get this. So take a look at it again. Um, all right. So I have my definitions in a header file, right? And so there are a lot of things going on with this software. So uh, I need like well, pay attention, right? So so in the header file, I've included all my different libraries. Now something important about your print apps, right? Print apps take a lot of code footprint. Your code actually doubles in size. There's an alternative called Altera underscore printf. Okay. The problem with Altera underscore printf here is it's very minimal in its uh, functionality. Okay. For example, it doesn't have display 
actually alt underscore printf might have uh, display in hex format. I'll check it out. Right. Uh, but it's I know it doesn't have unsigned. Can't display unsigned. Right. So for example, uh, let's re let me do alter underscore printfs for this and see what happens. Alt printf. So right now. Properties, no tasks. What's this? Ah, oh, interest. Data me. Ha, fix me. <laughs> so there is a little uh, note from the PS2 core, and I didn't see that. So it's really interesting. So let's re synthesize this in the sense that maybe there's one alter underscore printf I use. Okay. And I mean, not re synthesize, re compile. I'm sorry. So we're compiling. And DSP build complete. It's compiling our code, right? To, oh, there's an error. Let's see what it is. Invalid argument. So let's say it can open it. Well, let's try this again. So this is the issue with uh, Eclipse. Let's see, can I, because I synthesized this yesterday after class, let's delete this, yeah, delete it, All right, so let's try this again, hopefully this compiles, yeah, it did compile, so I don't know what the heck goes up with that, but it's, so you can see you have, come on, and now you should get the elf file. Damn, it keeps us slow. So there's the L file, all right? So you can see it's 82 kilobytes of code, all right? So let me just take out all the printfs with alt printfs. And I'll check if this works. I'll print f. I can just search and replace. Let me just do that with alt underscore printf. Find, I just don't want to replace. Replace find, replace find, replace find. Okay. Yeah, looks like alt printf, alt printf, alt printf, alt printf, alt printf. That's good, that looks good here. And then let's see over here. If I have any, I don't remember if I have any printfs here. No, it doesn't. Oops look like it so let's recompile this see what happens if I don't have any print tabs the code says you should reduce a lot and there it is all right so load it to a different address I'm getting some errors uh, let's see any problems no build complete so if we go into NIOS elf all right Loaded to a different address. So anyway, you can see the code size reduced a lot, right? 57 kilobytes. So printfs take a lot of footprint. Code footprint. Anyway, uh, so what am I doing first is I have this initialization. I have basically initialization routine. Right? So the way you communicate with interrupts is to use this idea of a context. Right? That is the way you pass arguments into ISRs. So what you want to have in the context depends on what you want to do, right? So in my case, what I'm going to have for interrupts is basically I'm going to have timers, okay? PS2 keyboard, PS2 mouse. Uh, well, not... So these are... The context is actually arguments that are passed to interrupts, right? So, so it's not like I'm have I'm going to interrupt on all of these. So, what are the arguments I'm passing into interrupts? Uh, it's like it'll take me too long to go through this entire code, right? So, I'll, again, I'll highlight the main ideas. So, what are the main ideas? First of all, initialization, right? So, what I do is first of all, uh, once I create this uh, context structure as a type. I make uh, this 
ISR context or I declare this ISR context of this type. Right? I make it a static because I don't want it to be modified in the sense I don't want an external entity modifying this. Yeah. Static. That is, I want it to be saved between calls. Yeah. Now, then what I do is I set the timer base. So I set the appropriate fields of this structure. Have you guys like seen stuff like this? Never? No, forget work. Have you seen stuff like this at MSOE? Like, yeah, declare a new data type, access elements of a structure, either using the dot operator or using, uh, so when do you use this? When do you use this? This, the pointer, okay? So it's not a pointer, so you use the dot. Okay, have you used this before? Mem copy. Okay, so uh, what, so these are all standard initialization, right? What mem copy does is I'm displaying my, so what this code does is not only does it do the, all the interrupts and stuff, but basically it computes the factorial of a number, right? And I'm gonna display it onto the screen. I'll demo this. Um, anybody have the DE one with them? If you don't, I'll demo it next class. That's what I was planning to do. The start of next class is gonna demo it. Well, actually, I'll demo it in lab. Right? So anyway, so what I'm actually doing is I'm basically extracting the digits of my computed result and I'm displaying it onto the screen, okay? But the way I get my number in is I use an array, okay? And the reasons for this, I'll explain a little bit in lab. Right? But the bottom line is, let's say I want to initialize my array with zeros, okay? One way to do it is using a for loop, yes? But let's say your array has a lot of elements. Thousand digits. Okay. I'm not computing the factor of a thousand digit number yet. I'm gonna do a hardware accelerator for that. But that's my own pet project. I just got inspired by this. But basically, this is embedded code, right? You don't wanna, you wanna be as efficient as possible. So what I do is I use this function called memcopy. So I basically have a zero array which I can initialize like that, right? So that's a constant array. That's, that's why I can do this. Is that clear? I can't do this to my regular array. This initialization in ANSI C, okay, only works if the array is a constant. Like it, in, on some C compilers, it might work if you don't have the constant. That is, it might work for a regular array, but it's not standard C, okay? That's not ANSI C. So anyway, I have a constant zero array, and I just copy this data, this zeros, into my array. That's what this does. So here's my destination, here's my source, here's the number of elements. It actually takes only like a, I think it's a single clock cycle instruction. It's very fast. Yeah. Okay, this is all efficient coding. So then what I do, I you do the usual thing. I open my device, okay? I check if I get null. If it is, oops, I couldn't, there's no keyboard. There's no mouse. I don't really uh, like stop the program. When I wait for, so I send resets, 0xff. I wait for response from the keyboard then I display it here on the console, and I'll demo this in lab, all this gritty stuff. But basically, once I initialize my keyboard and mouse, I enable the interrupts. However, for my character buffer, right? If since the display is the main part of my program, if it doesn't, if my character buffer is not initialized properly, uh, let's see, I don't execute further. I just stopped the program saying, could not open pixel buffer. So here's all the initializations, 
right? The, the, the final thing I do is I register all the interrupts. I enable them and then that's it, done. Okay. So something I noticed I got through all these comments, again, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I don't, I don't have time to cover all this in lecture, right? Uh, number one, but number two, the best way you understand this is through your projects. Uh, one of the things I noticed is this enhanced interrupt controller that I was working, that I was using last week, doesn't work with the Altera University program. So it seems like we always needed to use an external VIC. So I basically went back to the legacy interrupt controller, which is fine. I'm using the older routines. Last week I was using Alt IC underscore IRQ underscore register. I'm not using that anymore. Doesn't matter, right? So that's done. And here in my header file, I have my different, uh, well, my context structure, and then all my different functions. So let's look at some stuff here. Uh, 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 let's see. Let's look at the way I display colors, RGB format, okay? So the way RGB, 30 bit RGB works is, um, let's see. I think it's it's in your documentation. Let's take a look. I think it's five bits for no. Uh, basically, sorry, the character buffer is 16-bit RGB. Right. The pixel buffer is 30-bit RGB. The way the 16-bit RGB works, I think, for example, it's in the video documentation, uh, video.pdf. 16-bit RGB is five bits for red, six bits for green, and five bits for blue. I believe. Well, let's take a look. University program, audio, video, video, documentation, video.pdf, this will ever open up, um, background, RGB color space. Aha! Yeah, here it is. Five bits for red, six bits for green, five bits for blue. And here is 30 bit RGB. So everything you need is in the documentation. So for example, what I've done in my code is so this is, so I need to send out, where is it? No, we need character buffer, character foreground. Let me go into my, it's not in here, it's in my initialization. Let's see. Ah, here it is. So yeah, for my pixel buffer also, I use 16-bit RGB, and then I uh, RGB scale it to 30-bit. But for example, the way I do this is, let's see how many digits I have up here, hex digits. Yeah, I have four hex digits, yes, 16 bits. So this is my pure red, okay? So if you look at F8, so that's zero, that's one followed by, so what's F8? Let's just look at it. View programmer hex f8. So here it is, right? One, two, three, four, five bits. So this is pure red, okay? And then let's look at so f8. Then let's say I or. So what am I doing here? So I need to send 16 bits here, yes? So I'm oring my red hex and green hex. So let's see what I get. So what I should get is I should get 11 bits of ones followed by five bits of zeros. Okay, so let's see if I get that. So if I have F8, 7, E, okay. So let's see what I get. No, no, no. Hold on. Uh, I should get F8. So or these two, right? So let's say, can I? Oh, yeah, I can or it. Hold on. So F800 or with O7E0 equals. There you go. That's what I was looking for. So I get FFE0, right? So it's red, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or green. Is that clear? So I'm using bit masking to set the color I want. So let's say or red or green or blue, I'll get white. Okay. 
I think red or green is yellow, if I remember right. Yeah, it is yellow because I remember the box on the screen. I'll demo this in lab, okay? So I got a lot of things going on here, and I recommend you study, print this out, study this code line by line, make sure you understand what's going on. Okay, so this this code should be enough for you, all of your projects, okay? In addition to, uh, as, as a reference design, in addition to all this. Oh, university program, my master computer system. So here it is. Right? So a lot more reference design. Reference design is app software hell. So in addition to this, the code I gave you should be more than enough for your projects. If you understand how it works. All right, since we don't have a DE um, one board, uh, that's about it. Okay. So uh, I can, like, let me go actually go check out a DE one board and then I can demo this to you. Uh, but yeah, that I cannot record. So let's do that. And next lecture, what I'll do is I'll start SD card. Oh, since I'm on the topic of SD card. I've already posted all the materials for the SD card online. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so. All right, so under 3921, if you go to week 6 to 10 project. So here is, this is the one I'm going to use. The one from Chu. Okay, so uh, uh, there is another one from Terrasic. I'm not going to do the Terrasic one. Actually, uh, I haven't decided on what I'm going to do. I might do the Terrasic one, I might do the Chew one. They're both equivalent. Right? Oh, something about... Um, so I use, yeah, I do use Terrasic supplied modules. Uh, so the, this is what I want to address. So the your SD card slot on the DE1 can only read SD cards, I think, up to like 256 megabytes in size or something like that. There's some, very, there's some restrictions. But Val, for the last iteration of 3921, we've already ordered the appropriate SD cards. Uh, tech support has them. So don't use your SD cards because, first of all, your SD cards are probably... They are, they are the fast variants. They don't work on that, in that slot. Okay. So it's a particular type of SD card, and uh, we have them in tech support. They're very small. They're small size. And let's see. It's, I didn't mention it here. I think it's under here. I don't remember mentioning it. Here it is. SD card size is limited to uh, four gigabytes. All right, but even this, we, we have the correct SD cards for you in the tech support center. Don't use your own SD cards. It most likely won't work. Because I think the issue is the speed, if I remember right. It has to be the slower variance of the SD card, even if it's four gigabytes. I have also placed these two projects, I mean, these two folders online. So we'll go through these. And here is, let's look at the test code. Jurassic, fact file system, you know, main programs. Let's see what I do. Fine. I have to save it. Downloads. I don't even remember this. I haven't seen this in like years. Yeah, two years. Okay. But basically, yeah, so this is what this program does. It'll, uh, once you insert an SD card, it waits till you insert an SD card. Once you insert it, it checks if the card is in FAT16 format, and then it just displays the contents of the root directory. So this, again, should be more than enough for people who are using the SD card. And the way I, now looking at this, I remember now how the SD card is designed. So Terrasic's core is a bunch of VHDL modules. You need only two bits to communicate with the SD card. It's like I squared C, the data and the clock, right, primarily. So I just use PIOs. So bottom line, SD card reading and writing is very slow. It's not fast, but whatever. And I haven't really checked the university program course for the SD card in two years. I don't know how well this works. 
I wasn't happy with it if I remember right two years ago. But maybe they fixed it. Don't know. Anyway, I'm going to cover the Thoracic SD card core. So this will ever start. You can take a look at it. Damn, my computer's slow. Yeah, it looks like it crashed. If it ever come up. So anyway, I'll start the SD card uh, tomorrow. And we really don't have time for me. Yeah, here it is. So you can't really configure it. So I, yeah, I don't know how good this is. Okay. So I'll demo this um, design in lab, okay? Because I have to, I'm going to start synthesizing it. It takes some time. We'll go from there. All right. Uh, so that's it. I will see you next time.